The Little Mermaid, Part 3 Hello, this is Natasha, and I'm dropping by with the third and final part of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. In the second part, I told you how the Little Mermaid saved a human prince from drowning and how she fell in love with him. She longed to go and be with him in the world above, but to do so she would have to become human and to live and to die. But her soul would become immortal and she would go to heaven. She made up her mind to do this for him and so she went to see a sea witch to ask for her help. I know what you want, said the sea witch. It is very stupid of you. But you shall have your way. And it will bring you sorrow, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail and to have two supports instead of it, like human beings on earth, so that the young prince may fall in love with you and that you may have an immortal soul. And then the witch laughed so loudly and disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and lay there wriggling about. You are but just in time, said the witch, for after sunrise tomorrow I should not be able to help you till the end of another year. I will prepare a draught for you with which you must swim to land tomorrow before sunrise and sit down on the shore and drink it. Your tail then will disappear and shrink up into what mankind calls legs and you will feel great pain as if a sword were passing through you. But all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw. You will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement, and no dancer will ever tread so lightly. But at every step you take, it will feel as if you were treading upon sharp knives, and that the blood must flow. If you will bear this... I will help you. Yes, I will, said the little princess in a trembling voice as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul. But think again, said the witch. For when once your shape has become like a human being, you can no more be a mermaid. You will never return through the water to your sisters or to your father's palace again. And if you do not win the love of the prince so that he is willing to forget his father and mother for your sake, and to love with you with his whole soul, and allow the priest to join your hands that you may be man and wife, then you will never have an immortal soul. The first morning after he marries another, your heart will break, and you will become foam on the crest of the waves. I will do it, said the little mermaid, and she became pale as death. But I must be paid also, said the witch, and it is not a trifle I ask. You have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea. And you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it also. But this voice you must give to me. 
The best thing you possess will I have for the price of my draught. My own blood must be mixed with it, that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take away my voice, said the little mermaid, what is left for me? Your beautiful form, your graceful walk and your expressive eyes. Surely with these you can enchain a man's heart. Well, have you lost your courage? Put out your little tongue that I may cut it off as payment. Then you shall have the powerful draught. It shall be, said the little mermaid. Then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught. Cleanliness is a good thing, said she, scouring the vessels with snakes, which she had tied together in a large knot. Then she pricked herself in the breast and let the black blood drop into it. The steam that rose formed itself into such horrible shapes that no one could look at them without fear. Every moment the witch threw something else into the vessel, and when it began to boil, the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile. When at last the magic draught was ready, it looked like the clearest water there it is for you, said the witch. Then she cut off the mermaid's tongue so that she became dumb and would never again speak or sing. If the polypie should seize hold of you as you return through the wood, said the witch, throw over them a few drops of the potion and their fingers will turn into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no occasion to do this. For the polypi sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering draught, which shone in her hand like a twinkling star. So she passed quickly through the wood and the marsh, and between the rushing whirlpools. She saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished, and all within asleep but she did not venture to go into them, for now she was dumb and going to leave them for ever. She felt as if her heart would break. She stole into the garden and took a flower from the flower beds of each of her sisters, kissed her hand a thousand times towards the palace and then rose up through the dark blue waters. The sun had not risen when she came in sight of the prince's palace and approached the beautiful marble steps. But the moon shone clear and bright. Then the little mermaid drank the magic draught and lay like one dead. When the sun rose and shone over the sea, she recovered and felt a sharp pain. But just before her, stood the handsome young prince. He fixed his cold black eyes upon her so earnestly that she cast down her own and then became aware that her fish tail was gone and that she had as pretty a pair of white legs and tiny feet as any little maiden could have. But she had no clothes, so she wrapped herself in her long, thick hair the prince asked her who she was and where she came from and she looked at him mildly and sorrowfully with her deep blue eyes but she could not speak. Every step she took was as the witch had said it would be. She felt as if treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives but she bore it willingly and stepped as lightly by the prince's side as a soap bubble so that he and all who saw her wondered at her graceful swaying movements. 
She was very soon arrayed in costly robes of silk and muslin, and was the most beautiful creature in the palace. But she was dumb, and could neither speak nor sing. Beautiful female slaves dressed in silk and gold stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents. One sang better than all the others, and the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her. This was great sorrow to the little mermaid. She knew how much more sweetly she herself could sing once, and she thought, Oh, if he could only know that! I have given away my voice for ever to be with him. The slaves next performed some pretty fairy like dances to the sound of beautiful music. Then the little mermaid raised her lovely white arms, stood on the tips of her toes, and glided over the floor, and danced as no one yet had been able to dance. At each moment her beauty became more revealed, and her expressive eyes appealed more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. Everyone was enchanted, especially the prince, who called her his little foundling, and she danced again quite readily to please him, though each time her foot touched the floor, it seemed as if she trod on sharp knives. The prince said she would remain with him always, and she received permission to sleep at his door on a velvet cushion. He had a page's dress made for her, that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode together through the sweet scented woods, where the green boughs touched their shoulders and the little birds sang among the fresh leaves. She climbed with the prince to the top of high mountains, and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked, and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked, she only laughed and followed him till they could see the clouds beneath them looking like a flock of birds travelling to distant lands. While at the prince's palace, and when all the household were asleep, she would go and sit on the broad marble steps, for it eased her burning feet to bathe them in the cold sea water. And then she thought of all those below in the deep. Once, during the night, her sisters came up arm in arm, singing sorrowfully as they floated on the water. She beckoned to them, and then they recognised her, and told her how she had grieved them. After that they came to the same place every night, and once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, who had not been to the surface of the sea for many years, and the old sea king, her father, with his crown on his head. They stretched out their hands towards her, but they did not venture so near the land as her sisters did. As the days passed, she loved the prince more fondly, and he loved her as he would love a little child. But it never came into his head to make her his wife. Yet unless he married her, she could not receive an immortal soul. And on the morning after his marriage with another, she would dissolve into the foam of the sea. Do you not love me the best of them all? The eyes of the little mermaid seemed to say, when he took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. Yes, you are dear to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart, and you are the most devoted to me. You are like a young maiden whom I once saw, but whom I shall never meet again. I was in a ship that was wrecked, and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple, where several young maidens performed the service. The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. I saw her but twice, and she is the only one in the world whom I could love, but you are like her and you have almost driven her image out of my mind. She belongs to the holy temple, and my good fortune has sent you to me instead of her, and we will never part. Ah, he knows not that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands, 
I sat beneath the foam and watched till the human beings came to help him. I saw the pretty maiden that he loves better than he loves me. And the mermaid sighed deeply, but she could not shed tears. He says the maiden belongs to the holy temple. Therefore she will never return to the world. They will meet no more while I am by his side and see him every day. I will take care of him, love him, and give up my life for his sake. Very soon, it was said that the prince must marry, and that the beautiful daughter of a neighbouring king would be his wife, for a fine ship was being fitted out. Although the prince gave out that he merely intended to pay a visit to the king, it was generally supposed that he really went to see his daughter. A great company were to go with him. The little mermaid smiled and shook her head. I must travel, he said to her. I must see this beautiful princess. My parents desire it, but they will not oblige me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her. She is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were forced to choose a bride, I would rather choose you, my dumb foundling, with those expressive eyes. And then he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long, waving hair, and laid his head on her heart, while she dreamed of human happiness and an immortal soul. You are not afraid of the sea, my dumb child, said he, as they stood on the deck of the noble ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighbouring king. And then he told her of the storm and of calm, of strange fishes in the deep beneath them and of what the divers had seen there. And she smiled at his descriptions, for she knew better than anyone what wonders were at the bottom of the sea. In the moonlight, when all on board were asleep, except the man at the helm who was steering. She sat on the deck, gazing down through the clear water. She thought she could distinguish her father's castle, and upon it her aged grandmother, with a silver crown on her head, looking through the rushing tide at the keel of the vessel. Then her sisters came up on the waves, and gazed at her mournfully, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them and smiled and wanted to tell them how happy and well off she was. But the cabin boy approached and when her sisters dived down he thought it was only the foam of the sea which he saw. The next morning the ship sailed into the harbour of a beautiful town belonging to the king whom the prince was going to visit. The church bells were ringing and from the high tower sounded a flourish of trumpets, and soldiers with flying colours and glittering bayonets lined the rocks through which they passed. Every day was a festival. Balls and entertainments followed one another. But the princess had not appeared yet. People said that she was being brought up and educated in a religious house, where she was learning every royal virtue. At last she came. Then the little mermaid, who was very anxious to see whether she was really beautiful, was obliged to acknowledge that she had never seen a more perfect vision of beauty. Her skin was delicately fair, and beneath her long dark eyelashes, her laughing blue eyes shone with truth and purity. It was you, said the prince, who saved my life when I lay dead on the beach and he folded his blushing bride in his arms. Oh, I am too happy, said he to the little mermaid. My fondest hopes are all fulfilled. You will rejoice at my happiness, for your devotion to me is great and sincere. The little mermaid kissed his hand, and felt as if her heart were already broken. His wedding morning would bring death to her, and she would change into the foam of the sea. All the church bells rung, and the heralds rode about the town proclaiming the betrothal, 
Perfumed oil was burning in costly silver lamps on every altar. The priests waved the censers, while the bride and bridegroom joined their hands and received the blessing of the bishop. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, held up the bride's train, but her ears heard nothing of the festive music, and her eyes saw not the holy ceremony. She thought of the night of death, which was coming to her, and of all she had lost in the world. On the same evening, the bride and bridegroom went on board ship. Cannons were roaring, flags waving, and in the centre of the ship a costly tent of purple and gold had been erected. It contained elegant couches for the reception of the bridal pair during the night. The ship, with swelling sails and a favourable wind, glided away smoothly and lightly over the calm sea. When it grew dark, a number of coloured lamps were lit, and the sailors danced merrily on the deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of her first rising out of the sea, when she had seen similar festivities and joys. And she joined in the dance poised herself in the air as a swallow when he pursues his prey, and all present cheered her with wonder. She had never danced so elegantly before. Her tender feet felt as if cut with sharp knives, but she cared not for it. A sharper pang had pierced through her heart. She knew this was the last evening she should ever see the prince for whom she had forsaken her kindred and her home. She had given up her beautiful voice and suffered unheard of pain daily for him while he knew nothing of it. This was the last evening that she would breathe the same air with him or gaze on the starry sky and the deep sea. An eternal night without a thought or a dream awaited her. She had no soul and now... She could never win one. All was joy and gately on board ship, till long after midnight. She laughed and danced with the rest, while the thoughts of death were in her head. The prince kissed his beautiful bride, while she played with his raven hair, till they went arm in arm to rest in the splendid tent. They all became still on board the ship. The helmsman alone awake stood at the helm. The little mermaid leaned her white arms on the edge of the vessel and looked towards the east for the first blush of morning. For that first ray of dawn would bring her death. She saw her sisters rising out of the flood. They were as pale as herself, but their long, beautiful hair waved no more in the wind and had been cut off. We have given our hair to the witch, said they, to obtain help for you that you may not die tonight. She has given us a knife. Here it is. See, it is very sharp. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the heart of the prince. When the warm blood falls upon your feet, they will grow together again and form into a fish's tail, and you will once more become a mermaid and return to us to live out your three hundred years before you die and change into the salt sea foam. Haste then, he or you must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother mourns so for you that her white hair is falling off from sorrow as ours fell under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back. Hasten. Do you not see the first red streaks in the sky? In a few minutes the sun will rise and you must die. And then they sighed deeply and mournfully and sank down beneath the waves. The little mermaid drew back the crimson curtain of the tent and beheld the fair bride with her head resting on the prince's chest. She bent down and kissed his fair brow, then looked at the sky on which the rosy dawn grew brighter and brighter. 
Then she glanced at the sharp knife and again fixed her eyes on the prince, who whispered the name of his bride in his dreams. She was in his thoughts, and the knife trembled in the hands of the little mermaid. Then she flung it far away from her into the waves. The water turned red where it fell, and the drops that spurted up looked like blood. She cast one more lingering, half-fainting glance at the prince, and then threw herself from the ship into the sea, and thought her body was dissolving into foam. The sun rose above the waves, and his warm rays fell on the cold foam of the little mermaid, who did not feel as if she were dying. She saw the bright sun, and all around her floated hundreds of transparent, beautiful beings. She could see them through the white sails of the ship and the red clouds in the sky. Their speech was melodious, but too ethereal to be heard by mortal ears, as they were also unseen by mortal eyes. The little mermaid perceived that she had a body like theirs, and that she continued to rise higher and higher out of the foam, "'Where am I?' asked she, and her voice sounded ethereal as the voice of those who were with her. No earthly music could imitate it. "'Among the daughters of the air,' answered one of them. "'A mermaid has not an immortal soul, nor can she obtain one unless she wins the love of a human being.' On the power of another hangs her eternal destiny. But the daughters of the air, although they do not possess an immortal soul, can, can by their good deeds find one for themselves. We fly to warm countries and cool the sultry air that destroys mankind with the pestilence. We carry the perfume of the flowers to spread health and restoration. After we have striven for three hundred years to all the good in our power, we receive an immortal soul and take part in the happiness of mankind. You, poor little mermaid, have tried with your whole heart to do as we are doing. You have suffered and endured and raised yourself to the spirit world by your good deeds. And now, by striving for three hundred years in the same way, you may obtain an immortal soul. The little mermaid lifted her glorified eyes towards the sun and felt them for the first time filling with tears. On the ship in which she had left the prince, there was life and noises. She saw him and his beautiful bride searching for her. Sorrowfully they gazed at the pearly foam, as if they knew she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen she kissed the forehead of his bride and fanned the prince, and then mounted with the other children of the air to a rosy cloud that floated through the ether. After three hundred years, thus we shall float into the kingdom of heaven, said she. And we may even get there sooner, whispered one of her companions. And that is the story of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. I do hope you enjoyed it. For now, from me, Natasha. Bye-bye.